Welcome to the latest in my series of spectroscopy videos, this one covering the method of mass spectrometry. And in it, as I normally do, I'll discuss how mass spectrometers operate, and then I'll talk about how information from mass spectrometry is used to determine the structures of small organic molecules. And it turns out that mass spectrometry is one of the most powerful techniques we have for structure determination in organic chemistry probably second only to nuclear magnetic resonance. So to begin with, there are two basic pieces of information that we get from mass spectrometry. The first is it's one of the most common ways, maybe the most common way now, the determination of the molecular weight or molar mass of a substance. And in the case of high resolution mass spectrometers, we can often determine the molecular formula of a compound. So those two things go together. The second type of information we get from mass spectrometry is structural information through what's known through a process known as fragmentation. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But before I do that, I'd like to talk about how these things work so we know what we're dealing with. So this is a schematic diagram of a mass spectrometer. And we'll begin over on the left-hand side here. This is where you inject your, your compound. And there is, the way it's normally done is with a little syringe. You've got a syringe of your compound, usually in solution, and you inject it into the, into the injection port. And it goes into a, a, an area of very low pressure, and so the sample immediately goes into the gas phase. And the first thing that happens is the sample, the gas phase sample, is hit with a beam of ionizing radiation. In most spectrometers, those are beta rays, beams of electrons generated by a, a cathode ray source. Those electrons are very, very high in kinetic energy. So when the electron strikes a molecule of the sample, it transfers some of that kinetic energy to the molecule. And the energy is high enough that what often happens is that results in the ejection of another electron from the neutral molecule, creating a cation, or what's known as a radical cation. Since you've lost a single electron in most cases, you're left with unpaired electrons, So, which of course is a radical. So you form a radical cation. The ionized molecules then go through a long tube, and then in, in many mass spectrometers, most spe mass spectrometers work in similar fashion, but there are different ways that this occurs. The ions go into a strong magnetic field, as we see over here. When charged particles enter a magnetic field, the magnetic field deflects their trajectory. Larger molecules have more inertia, so they're their deflection is less than lighter molecules. So the larger molecules end up, end up taking a, a longer route through the magnetic field. The smaller, lighter molecules are more sharply deflected. And on the other side of the magnet, there is a detector. And so because the ions of different, of different masses have been deflected to, diff to different extents, they'll strike the, de the detector in different locations. So the place where the particles strike the detector is relative to the mass of the particles. And mass spectrometers are incredibly sensitive to mass. In fact, high resolution mass spectrometers, as we're going to see, can separate particles down to in the range of about 0.00. 0 0.05 atomic mass units, which is really incredibly sensitive considering how tiny an atomic mass unit it is. So where the particles strike the detector sends a signal to a computer. The computer then interprets those signals as masses, and the output then is a mass spectrum. So that's the next thing we'll talk about. Let's take a look at some of the features, the important features of a mass spectrum. So a mass spectrum consists of a plot intensity versus a ratio, or label as m over z as it normally is. And m over z stands for mass over charge. And the mass is an atomic mass unit, it's AMU. And charge is some multiple of the charge on an electron. So it's just charge. And so you've got the mass of the particle that comes out of the mass spectrometer over its charge. Now, in the vast majority of cases, the charge is one. That is, when the molecule is ionized, it's struck by 
a high energy electron and that knocks an electron out of the molecule. The molecule loses just one electron, so the molecule now has a positive one charge. But it's important to bear in mind that that's not always what happens. In some cases, two electrons can be knocked out of a single molecule. And if that's the case, then m over z, the mass is divided by 2. z becomes 2 because you've got a plus 2 charge on the molecule. And so the observed peak on the mass spectrum is half of what you would expect for the mass of that particular ion. That's unusual, but it does happen. So it's important to understand that that the abscissa is mass over charge and not just mass. So there are two important peaks in a mass spectrum. The first one I'll talk about is known as the molecular ion, which does not always appear. If you're lucky, it appears. In most cases, it does, but in many cases, it doesn't. So this is our molecular ion. And the molecular ion is the unfragmented ion. So that means that the molecule was struck by an electron, it lost an electron, became an ion, and it came through the mass spectrometer intact. It didn't fall apart. There were no bonds broken. Now, assuming that only one electron was lost, the molecular ion is what gives you the molar mass or the atomic mass of the molecule or the molar mass of the compound. Because it's unfragmented, all it's lost is a single electron. An electron has a vanishingly small mass, so it doesn't affect the molar mass of the compound. And so the molecular ion corresponds, again, assuming the charge is 1, to the atomic and therefore the molar mass of the compound. So this gives the molecular weight or molar mass of the compound. The other name peak in a mass spectrum is the highest one. So this always appears. There's always some peak that has the greatest intensity. That's what I mean by highest. So that's the highest peak in the mass spectrum, and this is known as the base peak. So the most intense peak is intensity, I should explain, is the number of ions. So ions with a certain mass, the more likely they are, the more you have, the more you have of them, and the more you have of them, the more the greater the intensity and the higher the peak. So the base peak corresponds to the most stable ion. As we're going to talk about, molecules get struck with such force by the ionizing radiation, the little electrons with high kinetic energy, that that kinetic energy that's transferred to the molecules causes most of those molecules to fall apart. It's the energy is high enough, in other words, to begin breaking bonds. And so the molecules fragment in the mass spectrometer. And we see lots and lots of peaks, typically, that are lower in mass than the molecular ion. The base peak corresponds to the most stable ion, the most stable fragment. So before we move on, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the molecular ion. And it turns out that the molecular ion is what's used to determine the molecular formula of a compound. And I'll give you an example of how that's done. So let's say that we have two different compounds. For example, we could have an isomer of pentane, C5H12. And we could have another compound with the formula C4H8O. Now it turns out that both of these compounds have exactly the same, well not exactly, have the same molecular weight or atomic mass. So the molecular weight of pentane is about 72 AMU, or grams per mole. The atomic mass is 72. And the atomic mass or molecular weight of this isomer here is also 72. Not an isomer of pentane, of course. So I mentioned a moment ago that high resolution mass spectrometers can detect differences in masses down to 0 0.0005 AMU. And so we know from general chemistry that the masses of atoms are not whole number integers of AMU. That is, atoms, um, you know, neutrons and protons, aren't exactly whole number integers of AMU. And so 
if you inject these substances through into a mass spectrometer, a high resolution mass spectrometer, we can get much more ac accurate masses than these simple molecular weights here. So the actual high resolution molar masses of these compounds from a high resolution mass spectrometer for pentane it's 72.0939 AMU or grams per mole. For C4H80 it's 72 0.0575. And so if you've got a compound and you're not sure what it is, you inject it into a high resolution mass spectrometer, and there are tables of formulas with the corresponding high resolution atomic mass. And so you can, if you if your compound gives you a molecular ion, you know what that is, you can go to the table and simply cross-reference the actual molar mass, the high, re the high resolution atomic mass of the compound with the formula that corresponds to it. So this is one of the easier and more common ways of determining the molar mass of a substance. So let's take a look now at some actual simple mass spectra. So here we have two actual mass spectra. The top one is of the very simple molecule methane and the bottom one is of propane. So we'll talk about methane first. So first off, there is a molecular ion present, which is also the base peak. So the molecular ion is this one right here. It's the base peak because it's the highest right there. It's at m over z is equal to 16. So z is one here. So this ion has lost one electron. And that means that its atomic mass is 16, which of course corresponds to the molar mass of methane. So this is the unfragmented ion. And just a few other features here. Notice that there are there's more than one peak. These other peaks, the only way they can be explained is by loss of hydrogen. So if the um, molecule fragments, remember methane is of course CH4, if it lo loses one hydrogen, you'll have a molar mass, molar mass of 15. If you lose two, then you'd have a molar mass of 14. Another thing you ought to notice here, it's a little bit hard to see, but this little tiny peak right here, this is known as the M plus one peak, M plus one, which means it it's one mass unit, one AMU, higher in mass than the molecular ion. How is that possible? Well, this is kind of a testament to the power of mass spectrometers to separate by mass. The M plus one peak here is due to methane molecules that have a larger isotope in them, an, an isotope with a higher mass than the normal isotopes that are present in methane. And what most likely causes this one is the replacement of a carbon-12, the most common form of carbon, with a carbon-13 iso isotope. Carbon-13 is about 1% so this of, of naturally occurring carbon, so this methane with a carbon-13 is hard to see here. It's, it's a very, very small peak, but that's the M plus 1 peak. Another possible thing that could generate a peak here would be the substitution of a proton with a deuterium, a hydrogen atom with a deuterium, which has an extra neutron, which increases the, the atomic mass by 1 AMU. But that's, uh, that's probably fairly insignificant. Deuterium is less than 1% of naturally occurring hydrogen. But there's, there's probably some tiny amount contributed by deuterium here as well. So let's take a look at propane now. The, in this case, the molecular ion is not the same as the base peak. Remember, the base peak is the highest peak. There it is. And here's the molecular ion. The molecular ion is the unfragmented ion, so it corresponds to the atomic mass of the molecule and the molar mass of the compound in grams. So as we know, the molar mass of propane is 44. So the atomic mass of a single molecule is 44 AMU. So that's the unfragmented ion. And this appears in clusters. You can lose protons to have these, these smaller peaks here, the peaks that, are, that have less mass than the molecular ion by one. So what's this cluster? over here, what's responsible for that. It's not too many ways that propane can fragment. There's just two carbon-carbon bonds and the rest are carbon-hydrogen bonds. So if you break a carbon-carbon bond, you're going to lose a methyl group. Methyl groups are 15 atomic mass units. So if you lose a methyl group, subtracting 15 from 44 gives 29. You have to think about that for a minute. Yeah, 29. So, so the base peak here is the result of loss of a CH3, a methyl group, off the propane molecule. That leaves a charged ethyl group, which is what this ion is. And of course, that ion can also lose some hydrogens. That 
results in a cluster as we typically see in mass spectra. So these are typical mass spectra for very small organic molecules. So in addition to molar mass and molecular formula, we can obtain structural information directly from the way molecules fragment in mass spectrometers. So I will talk a little bit about exactly how that happens. Recall that when the molecule is struck by the ionizing radiation as it enters the mass spectrometer, the electrons transfer a tremendous amount of kinetic energy to the molecule. So the high kinetic energy causes many, if not most, the molecules in many cases to fall apart, to fragment, causes the bonds to break. And so once your molecule is ionized by the ionizing radiation, you have what's known as a radical cation. So here is the molecule. It's lost an electron, so it's got a positive charge, and it has an unpaired electron, so that's our symbol for radical cation. Now this thing has a tremendous amount of kinetic energy, and so in many, if not most cases, it falls apart. And the way it does that, a bond will break, bond or bonds will break, and that will leave you with a charged fragment. I'll label that with a small m, and it's got a positive charge, so it's your charged fragment and a neutral fragment, label that in. Now, it's only the charged particles, the charged fragments, that interact with the magnetic field, that are, their trajectories are, are altered by the magnetic field, so they're the only ones that strike the detector. So the neutral fragments don't register in the mass spectrum at all, so we're interested in the charged fragments, so keep that in mind as we think more about fragmentation. In fact, the way that molecules fragment can only be understood in terms of the stability of the charged particles and radicals that are formed when they fragment, as we'll see in the following examples. We'll begin with 2-methylpentane. Two 2-methylpentane two is a radical cation, and it's going to fall apart now. And it's going to fall apart in the most stable possible charged cation and radical. And so think for a moment about what bonds, which carbon-carbon bonds would break. And the ones that are most likely to break, of course, give us the most stable fragments. And so those are going to be the bonds that give us the fragments with the most substituted radicals and carbocations. So one bond would be this one that we would expect to break. Now I should mention here that the molar mass of the compound, the unfragmented ion, is 86 AMU or grams per mole. So if we break this bond here, I'm not going to show this one right here because that's identical to this one. These two methyl groups are, are symmetrical. So I'll just show this one. A methyl group has a mass of 15 AMU. So we would expect a loss, I'll say minus 15 here. So when we subtract 15 from 86, we're going to end up with a fragment, this fragment over here. In fact, I'll draw the fragment. So there's your cation of 86 minus 15. So the mass that we would expect would be 71. So when we look at the mass spectrum of this compound, we're going to expect to see a peak at 71, a significant one. Now the other one that's going to give us a secondary carbocation, that is the other bond that can break, maybe I should use a different color for that one, would be this bond right here. That will also give us a secondary carbocation. And so when that one breaks, we will be left with this charge fragment. I'm not showing the neutral fragment here this carbocation. So this is three carbons, this is three carbons, they both have the same mass, so that's going to be a mass of 43. So we would expect a fragment with a mass of 43 for this one. So let's take a look at the actual mass spectrum. So here's the mass spectrum for 2-methylpentane. There's the unfragmented ion, the molecular ion at 86, 
And as we predicted, loss of the methyl group gives us a sizable peak, a relatively intense peak at 71. So remember, that's the breakage of that bond right there or that one right there. They're identical. And that leaves this fragment here that has a molar mass of 71. Breaking of this bond right here also gives us a secondary carbocation. Now remember, we're not breaking these bonds over here because those would give us primary carbocations. Those aren't nearly as good. So we're going to break this bond right here. That gives us this secondary carbocation, which has a mass of 43. And that turns out to be the base peak right here. So there's the 43. So as we predicted, the molecule is, is fragmenting in places that give us the most stable secondary carbocation. So let's take a look now at another example, this time 2,2-dimethylpropane, a more symmetrical molecule. This one's easier. Maybe I should have started with this one. So we have a quaternary carbon here bonded to four methyl groups. And so really, there's only one type of carbon-carbon bond that can break. And so this is simple. You can break any one of these, and you get exactly the same tertiary carbocation. There's your nice, stable tertiary carbocation. The molar mass of the unfragmented compound is 72. 72 AMU, or grams per mole. So again, we're losing a methyl group here. So we're going to lose a mass of 15. So 72 minus 15 gives us an ion with a mass, a fragment with a mass of 57. And I would predict that that would be the base peak because it's so simple for that to fragment that because you get a very stable tertiary carbocation that this will overwhelm any other fragmentation that we're going to see. So let's take a look at the mass spectrum of 2,2-dimethylpropane now. So here we have it. And there's our base peak as predicted at 57. What's interesting about this is recall that the actual molar mass of the compound is 72. And there's no molecular ion. We don't see anything at 72 here. That is common with molecules that fragment very easily. And it's also common with really large molecules. So if a molecule comes apart very easily, in this case it comes apart so easily because it gives us a very nice stable tertiary carbocation, it's not uncommon not to see a molecular ion. So you can't always count on seeing a molecular ion, an unfragmented ion, in a mass spectrum. So base peak, loss of the single methyl group to give a tertiary carbocation. So let's take a look at one more example before we look at some types of fragmentation, some common types of fragmentation. In this case, we're going to examine the effect of a double bond. So let's take a look at one hexene. So here we have one hexene. It's a radical cation. It's going to fall apart. Now, pause the video for a moment, and I'd like you to predict where this molecule is most likely to fragment. So let's take a look at this. The molar mass of the compound, the unfragmented ion, is 84. 84 AMU for the single molecule, 84 grams per mole for the substance. And if you predicted that the bond would break, most likely to break would be this one. You are correct. So we'll talk about why that is. When that bond breaks, we are going to form an allylic carbocation, which is a relatively stable one. The reason, of course, and we've talked about this, is that this is resonance stabilized. The little carbocations are resonance stabilized, so we're going to form a pair of resonance forms here. Remember, resonance imparts stability. Now, the fragment that we're losing has three carbons, and so we're losing a fragment, a propyl group essentially, and that's minus 43 AMU. And that leaves us with a fragment here that has a mass of 41 AMU. So again, I'm going to go out on a limb and predict in our mass spectrum that our base peak is going to be 41. No, I haven't, I haven't looked at this already. Well, actually I have, but I wouldn't have predicted that anyway, of course. And so here, of course, is the mass spectrum 
of one hexene. And so here's our molecular ion, our unfragmented ion, as we predicted, 84 AMU. And of course, as I predicted, our base peak, our base ion is 41. That's our allylic carbocation. So once again, our prediction has been has been confirmed. And if that's the bond you predicted to be broken, congratulations. If not, go back and study carbocation stability. So now hopefully you're getting an idea of how spectrometers operate and how fragmentation occurs. Bonds break in these molecules that give us the most stable fragments. And if you un understand fundamental organic chemistry and the stability of carbocations and radicals, you can predict what those bonds will be and what, frag what the major fragments will be. So if you suspect you have a certain compound, you can match up the fragmentation that you see in the mass spectrum, of course, to what you would predict the most stable ions to, to be from that compound. So this is a, a powerful way to determine the structure of, of small organic molecules, and actually very large ones too. Mass spectrometry is used for even determining the structures of, of massive molecules like proteins. So I'm going to move now to the final, thankfully, part of this video, which is some common, some more common ways in which molecules fragment. There are some functional groups that fragment in, in very common, specific ways. And so if you have suspect those functional groups and molecules, you can check for those types of fragmentations. So the first type of functional group fragmentation I'm going to discuss is alpha cleavage near heteroatoms. Type out alpha since I don't have the symbol in this program. And recall heteroatoms are atoms other than carbon and hydrogen. And these are really, this type of cleavage is really limited to heteroatoms with lone pairs, which normally you're talking about amines or oxygen-containing molecules. So nitrogen or oxygen-containing molecules is what this mostly applies to. So let's take a look at an example. I don't have a mass spectrum for this one, but it's easy to see because it's symmetrical. So I'm going to start with diethyl ether. So we take our diethyl ether and inject it into a mass spectrometer. We knock an electron out, form a radical cation. How does this thing fragment? Well, the alpha and alpha cleavage refers to the carbon-carbon bond that's one bond removed from the carbon-oxygen or carbon-nitrogen bond. And so the bond that we're going to break here due to alpha cleavage is that one. And of course, we could also break this one here. That one's identical. So breaking that bond will result in the loss of a methyl group, which we've seen as 15 AMU. The molar mass, or molecular weight, of ether is 74, 74 AMU, the atomic mass. I should say atomic mass there. And so we would expect a very significant peak at 74 minus 15 which of course is 59. So let's draw a picture, a structure for that ion, and talk about why that forms so readily. So at first glance, that's a primary carbocation, and that shouldn't happen, right? Primary carbocations are, are terrible. The thing is, you've got these lone pairs here, and carbocations, of course, are sp2 hybridized, and this can rotate such that one of these lone pairs overlaps with the empty 2p orbital here. And so once again, as we saw with the allylic carbocation, we're going to get a resonance stabilized carbocation here. So there are a couple of resonance forms. I'll draw the other one. So there is our resonance stabilized carbocation. And that's what these lone pairs on these heteroatoms do, and that's why we see alpha cleavage. And so we would expect here to see an ion at a very strong ion, probably the base peak, at 59. So this would be about 59 AMU. So that's what we would expect for diethyl ether. Let's take a look at another one. This one I do have a mass spectrum for. So the second example of alpha cleavage here. And this is 2-butanol. Two, two so there's our 2-butanol. And we look at one bond removed from the carbon-oxygen bond, and there are two of those in this molecule. And so with alpha cleavage here, we would expect 
this bond to break. That's loss of a methyl group, minus 15. And we'd also expect, let's color code this, this bond to break. So both of those bonds are alpha cleavage, and this is loss of an ethyl group, that's 29, so that's minus 29. Now, and of course, the overall molar mass of the compound of 2-butanol is 74 again. So once again, if we lose the methyl group, we're going to see Here's the cation that we're going to see, and that, of course, is resonance stabilized. So that can come down there. And once again, that would be 59. And the other fragment that we're going to see is that carbocation. And that gives us, that mass is 45. So we're predicting a relatively strong intense peak at 59 and another one at 45. So let's take a look and see what we get. And of course, once again, we're vindicated. Here's our molecular ion, the unfragmented ion, very small one at 74. So alpha cleavage loss of the methyl group minus 15 gives us our expected peak at 59. And then loss of the ethyl group, minus 29 on the other side of the carbon bond of the OH, gives us our base ion at 45. So as we predicted, alpha cleavage gives us our two most intense ions in the mass spectrum of 2-butanol. There is another type of alpha cleavage to be confusing, and that occurs near carbonyl compounds. This is a really important type of fragmentation. say near carbonyl groups. And so let's take a look at a quick example of that. And we're going to look at the mass spectrum of 4-methyl-2-pentanone. So alpha cleavage near carbonyls occurs at the carbon bond, the carbon-carbon bond to the carbonyl carbon. So, and there are two of those in this molecule. With an aldehyde, there, will, there would only be one. So the first one is this one. And once again, that's loss of methyl group, so we're expecting a loss of 15 there. The molar mass of this compound is 100. That makes things easy. And so one fragment that we're going to expect if we lose 15 from 100, we'll end up with a fragment at 85, a peak at 85, and I'll draw the structure of that and show you why it's likely to happen, why it's particularly stable. Now this is an acyl carbocation, and it is, again, resonant stabilized because we have these lone pairs here. So we've seen this before. So one of these lone pairs can come down and give us that resonance form. So this is why, because we get a resonance stabilized carbocation again, we tend to see alpha cleavage. And of course, the mass of this thing will be 85. So make a mental note of that. We're going to expect a significant peak in the mass spectrum at 85. Now, we can also get alpha cleavage to the other side of the carbonyl carbon. That's this one right there. And so that's going to give us this acyl carbocation. And again, it is also resonance stabilized. Now, loss of this big fragment here, that is about 57, I believe. So this is minus 57. It's an isobutyl group that we're losing here. And so that leaves us with a fragment that has mass of 43 AMU. So again, make a mental note of those. We're going to see a peak due to alpha cleavage at 85 and a peak at 43. So let's take a look at the mass spectrum of 4-methyl-2-pentanone. And once again, our predictions have been vindicated. So molecular ion at 100, loss of the methyl group alpha cleavage on the methyl side gives us our acyl carbocation 
with an a overall mass of 85 AMU. Loss of the isobutyl group on the other side, or the alpha cleavage on the other side of the carbonyl, gives us our other acyl carbocation. That gives us the base peak with a mass of 43. Now there's one more predictable ion that we haven't talked about here. That's this one right here. It's called the McLafferty ion. And that's another type of common, although less common, it's still a common type of, of cleavage that happens with carbonyls. So that's what we'll discuss next. The second very common type of cleavage we see with carbonyl compounds is known as a McLafferty rearrangement. And again, we're going to stay with that same molecule because we already, we've already seen that that occurs from the previous mass spectrum. I think I'll skip drawing, writing the name again. So here's our 4-methyl-2-pentanone. For this to occur, there is one important requirement, and that is there must be a proton on a gamma carbon. That's a, so let me label the carbons here. So here's our alpha carbon, here's our beta carbon, and here's our gamma carbon. So there must be a proton on a gamma carbon, carbon gamma to the carbonyl carbon, that can achieve a configuration that's almost like a, a six-membered ring here. So if we had a bond here, we'd have a six-membered ring. That's it, conformationally labile enough that you can get the, this gamma proton, this proton on the gamma carbon, very close to the carbonyl. And I actually made, made a little bit of a mistake drawing this. Remember, this is a radical cation. It's got a positive charge, and so we've got an unpaired electron here. So I'm going to erase one of those electrons. And I'll show you what happens in a McLafferty rearrangement. I'm going to use fish hooks here to show, I should have drawn this larger. In fact, I think I'm going to do that. So this unpaired electron will pair up with an electron from this carbon-hydrogen bond. The other electron will pair up with an electron from this carbon-carbon bond. These are fish hooks again showing the movement of single electrons. And this electron will pair up with an electron from this bond, like so. And so that's going to give us a couple of fragments. So the oxygen bearing part of the molecule is the cation, so that's what's going to appear in the mass spectrum. Again, recall that the molar mass of this compound was 100. And so this fragment is the equivalent of a loss of 42, which means that we're going to expect, expect a peak. And if you recall, we've already seen this at 58 AMU. M over Z is equal to 58. So let's take a look at the mass spectrum one more time for this compound. And once again, there's the McLafferty ion. So that's this fragment of the molecule right here. This comes off as an alkene, that bond broken. It's really a beta bond that's broken in this case. So this is 58, and this is loss of 42. And that is a McLafferty rearrangement. And recall, you must have a proton on a carbon that's gamma to the carbonyl carbon. And it has to be able to achieve a conformation that can get very close to this oxygen. But that's a common, that's, that's fairly common in organic molecules. So this is not an unusual fragmentation when you have carbonyl compounds. There are a couple of other names that are used for these common carbonyl types of fragmentation. A McLafferty rearrangement is also known as Norrish type 2 cleavage. And alpha cleavage is sometimes referred to as nor Norrish type 1. So alpha cleavage, that's, remember, these two fragments right here, Norrish type 1. McLafferty rearrangements, Norrish type 2 cleavage. And so those are the most common ways that carbonyl compounds fragment. I'll conclude the discussion of types of fragmentation with uh, one final functional group, and that is the mass spectrometry of alkyl halides. So what do we see? when we take mass spectra of halogens.
And so I think first we'll consider chlorine. And the example that we'll look at is benzyl chloride. Now we already know from our discussion of alkyl halides that carbon halogen bonds, with the exception of carbon fluorine bonds, so this, what we say here, will apply to all the halogens except for carbon fluorine bonds because those are particularly strong. Carbon halogen bonds are particularly weak, generally speaking, so we're going to expect that bond to break here for a couple of reasons. One, the carbon chlorine bond is relatively weak, and two, of course, that's going to give us a resonance stabilized benzylic carbocation. So when we break that bond, we'll end up with the benzylic carbocation as our charge fragment. And there are about half a dozen resonance forms you could draw for that. And a chlorine atom. Now the molar mass of benzyl chloride is about 126. Chlorine is 35, or at least the most common isotope of chlorine is 35. So we're talking about minus 35 here. So 126 minus 35 will give us what I expect to be the molecular ion, not the molecular ion, the base peak rather, at 91. M over Z is 91. So let's take a look at that. So here is our mass spectrum of benzyl chloride. Molecular ion at 126. Base peak, base ion at 91 is predicted. There's one more feature I'd like to talk about here. Remember we talked about M plus 1, which is due mainly to carbon-13 plus a tiny amount of deuterium isotopes. And we see an M plus 1 peak here. But we also see a very significant M plus 2 peak. That, that means that it's the molecular ion plus 2 mass units. So the molecular ion's at 126. The M plus 2 peak is at 128. What is this from? So let's go back to talk about that. So it turns out there are two very common isotopes of chlorine. One is chlorine-35. And it's got a relative abundance of about 75.77%. And recall from general chemistry that relative abundance refers to the percentage of naturally occurring chlorine that that isotope represents. So in other words, 75.77% of naturally occurring chlorine is chlorine-35. But there's another, there's another very common isotope of chlorine, that's chlorine-37. And its abundance, it's most of the rest of chlorine, is 24.23%. So about a third of naturally occurring chlorine is chlorine-37. And this is what accounts for the two peaks, that is the molecular ion has a mass of 126. But this has two extra neutrons, which gives us two extra mass units, which gives us a mass that we observe at 128. And so this is our M plus 2 peak that we saw in the mass spectrum. And so if you suspect chlorine, you will always see an M plus 2 peak in the molecule for, for a molecule that only has one chlorine in it. That is about a third the intensity of the molecular ion, if a molecular ion is seen. So that's a little trick to look for if you suspect chlorine in your molecule, a single chlorine. And we see something similar with bromine, which is the last thing we're going to talk about. And we'll use a very simple example for bromine, because it's very similar to chlorine, and that is bromoethane. And just as we expected with chlorine, the bromine carbon bond is even weaker. And so we would predict that bond to break fairly easily. Although, one interesting thing here is we're going to, this, this implies perhaps the formation of a fairly unstable carbocation, a primary carbocation. So we'll take a look at the mass spectrum in a moment. Before I do that, um, I want to talk about the relative abundances of the two common isotopes of bromine because as was the case with chlorine, there are two very common isotopes of bromine. Those are bromine-79 and bromine-81. So 
Bromine 81, obviously, is two mass units above 79. So again, we're going to expect an M plus 2 peak. So let's take a look at the relative abundances of both of these isotopes. Bromine 79 is the more common one, but only barely. So bromine 79 is 50.69% of naturally occurring bromine. And so almost all of the remaining bromine is bromine 81, which is 49.31%. And so if we see a molecular ion, it will be the molar mass of the compound, which is 108 AMU. And we're going to expect to see an M plus 2 peak. It's, two, of course, two mass units higher, which is 1V110. So let's take a look at the mass spectrum now of bromine, or bromoethane, rather. So again, as we predicted, we've got our molecular ion at 108 and a very intense, and that's the, the molecular ion is also the uh, base peak in this, in this mass spectrum. And a very intense, almost 50% of natural occurring bromine is bromine 81. And so the M plus 2 peak is, reflects the, the isotopic abundance of bromine 81 and naturally occurring bromine. So you always see this when you have mass spectra of compounds containing bromine. If you see a molecular ion, so you see these pairs of ions that are almost identical in intensity because of the two isotopes of bromine. So interestingly, we do see fragmentation where we expected, that is cleavage of the carbon bromine bond, but we do not see a peak at 29, which would be the ethyl group. What we see is a peak at 79 and 81. That means that the charged fragment is actually the bromine. So bromine here is retaining the positive charge rather than having the positive charge on the small primary carbocation. Remember, primary carbocations are terrible. So we're not seeing the ethyl fragment. What we're seeing is a bromocation, which is interesting. So that concludes my much longer than expected discussion of mass spectrometry. Please let me know if you have any questions, and we will do problems in class.